All right, well, you guys have heard the news. It's all over the internet. We know what's going on. I know what's going on. You know what's going on. And of course, I'm talking about the leaks. Twitch has leaked it all. Everything fully exposed. All the source code, the full website, and more importantly, how much money streamers are making. And this has shocked a lot of people. It shocked a lot of people. And for some reason, it's surprising to them. And I don't know why, because this information has been public for the most part. This information has been public for a long time, but people have compiled the earnings of major Twitch streamers and people are like shocked at the numbers. So I figured we'd take a little bit of a look at it just for reference sake here. The gross payouts of the top one highest paid Twitch streamers from August, 2019 until October, 2021. And you can see here, you know, over the past couple of years, these guys have made some money. 9 million to Critical Role XQC with like 8.5 million. Um, and then it starts falling off real quick as you go down the top 100. But the important thing to me here is that within this top 100, there is only two people. There's two people who actively stream fighting games who are in the top 100 that I saw. We got Mango at 93, and then uh, Maximilian Dude was also in there. Two people connected to fighting games in the top 100. Um, and that's it. So that got me thinking, you know, we should talk about how fighting game players make money and how much do they potentially make? Because the answer will shock you. Just kidding, it's not much. <laughs> Spoilers, if that top 100 did, didn't give it away. There's not many ways and there's not much money, but there is some, there is some, and I figured it'd be worth talking about, especially for those who are interested in playing fighting games competitively or just curious about this, because I think there was a misconception for a long time about what makes a professional fighting game player. Players that you see that are good, doesn't mean they're making a living playing fighting games, even, even if they're doing amazing at tournaments and uh, it doesn't make them professional fighting game players. So of course, let's break out the notepad here. Let's 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 talk about it. How professional fighting game players make money. The first category for making money, of course, is tournaments. This is where I think the popular perception is all the money for fighting game players comes from tournaments, right? Well, uh, surprised. There's no money in tournaments unless you are the top 0.001% of the top players. There is little to no money to be made in tournaments. And I think this is what people think is going on, that fighting game players make money in tournaments. It is extremely, extremely competitive to make any money in tournaments and the prize payouts are not good. I figured I'd just go with some examples here. Some people might consider me to be a professional fighting game player, but fortunately we have resources out there to disprove that. If you guys haven't heard of Liquipedia, it's a pretty interesting website that keeps track of esports players and they pull a lot of information in here. And I honestly don't even know where they get this info from, but I do want this photo to be replaced because I am not a fan of this Equinox photo. I gotta say, we should, we should do another reshoot on that one. But they have pretty much all of my major placings for you know my entire fighting game career for the most part. They show the prize money that I made. This money is accurate. They even have me making 53 bucks at Frosty Fostings. I don't know how they had this, this number here, but they know that I got an envelope with $53 in it for Frosty Fostings 2020. You can see here my career lifetime earnings, $6,270. Some people would consider me to have been a professional fighting game player. I hope this dissuades you from from thinking that that's the case. What about someone that, you know, one of the best American Street Fighter players of all time, he's been in Capcom Cup multiple times. What about my guy, 801 Strider, Gustavo? He's been in Capcom Cup for Street Fighter 4 and Street Fighter 5. Let's look at his career winnings spanning over a decade, $14,580. Uh, well, he did make Capcom Cup. How much money did he make at Capcom Cup? He got 25th, he went 0-2 at Capcom Cup and he made $250. If you qualified for Capcom Cup in the hardest circuit ever, you know, the CPT, I think it's tougher and tougher as years go on. If you make it and you are one of the top 32 best players in the world and you qualified for the world finals and you do not perform, you get $250. So you can notice a theme here that the prize pools are extremely, extremely top heavy. If you're not first, you're last. Oh yeah, this is all before taxes, of course. So you, you just don't make much money unless you're absolutely killing it. 
So let's look at someone who's absolutely killing it then. Punk. Punk is probably the most winningest player in Street Fighter V history, and he has a career winnings of 345,569. Ah, there's hope yet. I um, mean, he's he's won many premieres, right? So Capcom Cup getting second place, 50K, easy 50K there. Uh, any of his premier wins, uh, $7,500, $7, Red Bull Conquest, $7,000, 12K for winning uh, regional finals, not too bad, not too bad. Final round 2019, oh, 8,000, that makes sense. So yeah, if you can just win every premiere, you can make a lot of money. Of course, a big chunk of that is because he won E-League. E-League was the big one where he won a lot of money at. That's how you can rack up some money there. But what if you just win Capcom Cup outright? Idom, Capcom Cup, 279,975 because of the big 250K from Capcom Cup. It looks like if you're the 0.000001%, you can make good money. But if you're like the top 32 in the world, which is still one of the best players and one of the best human beings at a craft out of thousands and thousands of competitors, you kind of don't get much. You kind of don't get much, right? It just falls off so quick. Basically, it's just not a sustainable route. So yeah, there is money to be made in tournaments. What's missing here though, I would say, is the next wave, which is Locals, Matcherino, NLBC, WNF. That's actually the new wave for making money. So I'm not including in this any of the money that Punk or IDOM or anyone else makes from those locals. I will, will say I've made some money playing NLBC, playing WNF, because Match Reno and crowdfunding has increased the prize pools for weekly. So if you have weeklies you can farm, you can definitely make a lot of money. And the thing is, it's not even that much because if you look at real weeklies, you got to look, look at the Smash community. Smash community has so many weeklies with like 100 plus players and the top players win every single time and they farm like a cool like couple hundred bucks every week. That is so common in the Smash community, you would not believe. We're out here sweating in NLBC with some of the best players in, in America on the East Coast and on, uh, WNF on the West Coast. And you might get like $300 if you get first place on a really good night. On a really good night. So tournaments they're tough it's hard to get a lot of money you have to be in the 0.0001% to make that kind of money so it's not reliable for most people however um i kind of hinted at it previously but there's other forms of tournaments i'm mostly referring to open bracket tournaments here what if we instead you know had invitationals so things like street fighter league street fighter league if you guys don't know People are competing for big money, but they pay the players. There's a guaranteed minimum amount of an appearance fee for being on Street Fighter League. I know I have this insider info because, you know, young Brian F, I used to be on Street Fighter League. I, I was there before. Here I am. Look at me looking so bright, hopeful for the future. And, you know, I'm there with my measly 47% win rate because they forced me to play Abigail in half my matches. Being on Street Fighter League, I can tell you that originally we were going to get no money. No money for spending two weeks straight away from our family, our friends, and our careers, and our jobs to go play video games. And originally, they weren't going to pay us anything. You had to win the prize money or get nothing. However, after some negotiation, they worked it out. We all got a guaranteed prize of $700 for two weeks. We got $700 for two weeks at Street Fighter League. So you lose money by spending time to play the game, and then you don't win prize money, and you go home, and that's about it. So that was Street Fighter League Season 1. Now, the prize pools, or the, the guaranteed amount of money that you get has definitely increased since then, but I don't know how much they're making these days. I, I got some insider intel about the prize amounts, but but it's it's not that much. It's not that much, but that is another revenue stream for fighting game players. It does exist. However, it's not much for the time investment. Also, another issue, it's selective. Not many people can be on Street Fighter League. They can only have so many people at a time for any kind of league format. There's limited seats at that table, so it's not really you can't count on making money from these sorts of things. But if you're selected and you're lucky enough, you can make a, a little bit of cash by being selected. And then on top of that, if you perform well, once again, it goes into the tournament route of you just, you know, you make money from winning. So if you're in the top 0.001%, once again, you can actually make some money. It's not a guarantee. But speaking of guaranteed, obviously what's guaranteed is money from teams and sponsors. Right? That's that's guaranteed money once you make it, once you got a, a jersey on your back and a few letters abbreviated before your name in the stream title, that means that means you're making the bank, right? Well, no. It's it's not true. Most players do not make a livable salary. 
most players don't even make a salary. If you're lucky, I would say you get a stipend, I would call it. At minimum, what they provide, you should get paid travel, air plus hotel and tournament fees covered. So this is the tier where most people with a logo on their jersey and some letters in, in, in front of their name, most people are at this tier. Actually, that's a lie. Most people are at this tier. Most people are here. They get a jersey and they don't do anything for them. I don't want to include this because this means you're not sponsored, all right? This means that you are just being taken advantage of and I don't know what you're doing. Move on from that. Most people are at this tier of sponsorship where maybe they get some level of, of pay travel arrow and hotel and tournament fees, or maybe it's like a flat rate. You know, they get so much of an allowance to use on travel for, or, or tournament coverage so that they can go to so many tournaments a year, right? And if you're lucky, you might get a little bit extra cash on top of that, but the vast majority of players do not make a livable salary. However, the top 0.0001% of top players can and do make good money. There is a tier of player that actually has a legitimate sponsor that pays them a legitimate salary, which they can sustain themselves with. And some of them make decent money, but it's, it's, not the norm and it's not to be expected getting to this tier is highly 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 un unlikely and once again if you're just getting the the expenses covered you're not making income you're just having expenses covered so that you can go to compete for tournaments to most likely not win money go to a premiere you're going to show up to that premiere there's going to be punk there's going to be idon there's going to be daigo there's going to be tokido there's going to be it is on momochi and then all the local killers me and rob every player you can think of is going to be there you can beat so many known top players have an amazing run get ninth and go home losing money you know i showed my my Liquipedia page. So let's go back to final round 2019. I got $750. I was not sponsored at this time. I paid for registration, which, you know, it's going to be $10 for the, the prize pool. And I don't know how much it was for the venue. Usually it's like 70, 80, 90 bucks sometimes. Then there's the flight. Easily, easily 400 bucks. I usually just go with Delta and try to rack up miles. So I did, you know, I got my, my credit card for the miles and everything like that. I try to get some free flights here and there. Then you have to have food ubers just to get around the ubers to and from the airport are going to be like another 100 bucks easily 150 food for the weekend is going to rack up another 150 100 um and then there's housing i think for this one uh, i stayed with a couple of people out from utah they had an airbnb and i forgot how much i paid them for it but i think i got a pretty good deal but i'm, I'm fairly certain i lost money from from this tournament so this is the one where i won 750 dollars. and look at all the others where i won nada nothing this career total here is a lie. It's a lie. I'm in the red so much from tournaments, it's not even funny. So these are the most common ones. People think it's all like tournaments, invitationals and things like that. It doesn't really apply unless you're a select few, but there's other ways to make money. There actually are other ways to make money, right? So the next one I would say is consulting slash appearance fees. Ooh, ooh, this is where it gets kind of like insider intel, right? I don't think it's as common as before, and now invitationals are kind of what you have. But you know, some players used to get paid to show up to events. That's a thing. You know, top players sometimes, if they have a big name, would get paid to go to an event, or they'll have their hotel and flight covered for an event to show up to use their, their celebrity to get more people to show up and enter the event. That's a real thing. Now, invitationals and leagues, they're, they're more straightforward about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's very clear that these these are invited players, so that they get, they're getting special treatment. I don't know if this is as common as it used to be, but this was pretty common in like the Street Fighter 4 era and Street Fighter 5 early on. Very common for this to be a thing. So if you're a celebrity of a top player, you can get paid to just show up. This is also very well documented in the Smash community because, you know, they, they are much more of a culture of celebrity, I would say, than the FGC, even though the FGC has that as well. Other things you can do, you can start to diversify, like you can be brought on to do uh, uh, analysis, right? I would not consider myself to be a commentator, but I got brought on from my experience in, in playing fighting games and, you know, doing some content. I got to do the Capcom Cup 2020 season fi finals as an analyst. It's not commentary, but if you are a top player and you've shown some kind of skills and communication and, and be able to speak about the game, you might be able to diversify and get brought on to do analysis and actually get paid without all the risk, right? Get your flight paid for, get your hotel paid for, <laughs> do a job 
and you get a paycheck. It's a lot different than doing a tournament. So you can get paid to do that. So people who aren't normally in broadcast as much, like Javits, you know, he got the opportunity to, to do that at, at Intel World Open and, and make some money there. But, you know, players can do that as well. Also, what people don't talk about too much is coaching. This is something interesting that I think it used to be taboo, actually. People used to rag on people for offering coaching services for years. Like, oh, who do you think you are to think that you can actually impart wisdom on other people and charge for it, right? I always thought that was weird that people got heated about that. But now, now it's kind of a thing. You see Medify is like a platform that's going around everywhere for helping people schedule and do paid coaching services and a lot of fighting players are doing that and people are interested in that i personally don't you know my personal opinion on coaching is i think it can be helpful i don't think it's needed but i guess some people just like to be held accountable and spend money on coaching um to maybe like motivate themselves to actually practice what they're trying to learn but coaching is a real thing it's a way to make money if i was a full-time fighting game player i probably would do coaching right i would try to go nine to five with ways to generate revenue and do coaching. So that's another way you can actually make, make money. I'm surprised it's not as popular as it could be, to be quite honest. You've done everything on the list, Fi, except sponsor to wear a jersey. You skipped a very important step. I don't know. You might have to, to go back and relive this one. Another one, endorsements slash advertisements. Kind of similar to getting paid to show up to events. You can just be paid to wear some headphones. Once you get big enough as a professional fighting game player, you can potentially land some sweet endorsements. And that's why we see things like, you know, here, here's Punk ready to train with these nice HyperX wireless headsets, hashtag ad. So it's an ad, there he is holding his HyperX headphones. And this is what I wanted to actually show. Uh, Myers had this photo. I was trying to find this photo of Punk actually in a GameStop, I believe, <laughs> wearing the headsets. I think there's one with Sagem also. So yeah, you can do ads and it's not only just for products. You also see this sometimes for events. Like I, I think Punk and Justin Wong had paid tweets for Intel World Open. They would have tweets like promoting the event that had hashtag ad in it, which I thought was strange. So you can get paid to do promotions, to do ads of that nature. Yeah, it, it, it can go overboard though. It can go overboard with the uh, the product placement and the advertisement. <laughs> so yeah, endorsements, advertisements, you can generate revenue with that, you know, paid tweets, ad campaigns, things of that nature. Now, you notice there's something that I haven't mentioned at all, and most of this stuff is pretty unique to actually being a fighting game player. But the last one is where I think you end up making the most money or there's the most opportunity for money. And that is, of course, circling all the way back around content creation. Content creation is where you make the most money. We, we started this segment talking about how, you know, the top 100 streamers, like how only like two of them are tangentially at minimum related to fighting games. And none of them are professional, traditional fighting game players. Mango is, a you know, one of the best melee players of all time, if not the GOAT. But Maximilian, dude, he is, you know, more on the casual side of doing fighting game content creation for casual fans. So none of them are professional, like traditional FGC players. But even with that hard limit of being a content creator solely focused on competitive FGC, uh, focus, it's probably the most stable way to generate income. So a lot of these things we talked about, the problem with it is that they rely on you being the best of the best of the best of the best. There's no like trickle down economics in the FGC. Everything is way too top heavy. So there is money in being a professional fighting game player, but you only get that money if you're at the top. And most of the time, that positioning only lasts for a very short period of time. Prize pools at tournaments, way too top heavy. I do not understand that. I think they're unsustainable. Sponsorship payouts, you know, they're very top heavy. That one makes sense because you can't sustain paying, you know, a, a low tier, even a top 30 fighting a player in the world because they're not going to make a return on investment. Content creation, you can make money even if you're not the best in the world. Any money I've made is from content creation, right? I've lost money competing, made money doing content. I am like in Street Fighter, a top 100 player. My CPT rankings were like 3,500 and then like 50 for 2017, 2018, 2019. So it's kind of on the lower end if you average those, but I'm a top 100 CPT player and I've only lost money competing. I've made investments into competing, but I've made money doing content creation. If you're not the best in the world, the way you make money playing fighting games is tournaments are your investment to grow your brand and to gain notoriety. Tournaments invest in your brand 
as a player. You go to tournaments to do well, to get your name out there. That's how people first find out about you. Or it's one of the main ways people can find out about you. Do well at a tournament and your stream slash YouTube will benefit. You need to have your stream, your Twitch stream ready and your YouTube channel going and doing well at a tournament will take a new audience and potentially convert some of them into viewers of your content. They will discover you through that medium and you'll be able to grow through that. It's a way to grow in an already established community and established vertical. The, the, the strength that we have with tournaments and everything of that sort is that we've built up this vehicle here to get people in front of eyeballs. That's what the CPT offers. That's what tournaments offers. That's what legacy events with a lot of history offer. They offer a way for you to come in, be as good or bad as you are, you know, earn your placing and then be able to reap the reward of notoriety from that. If you are not ready to capitalize on that investment, you are not going to make any money. If you are like, finishing fifth place, fourth place, third place, and that's that's all you finish and you're not consistently getting first, and you're not ready to convert those people into people who participate in your brand, you are not making money. So your content creation is there to absorb the benefits of your tournament placings. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the detail about content creation. If you wanna know like all the different breakdowns of how to make money streaming in YouTube, you should watch a guy named Devin Nash. It's who I totally shamelessly ripped off the notepad format from and these kind of talks from. Devin Nash breaks down all the ways streamers make money. Cause you know, you can go into Twitch, like how do people make money from Twitch, right? Subs, donations, ad revenue, bounties, sponsored streams. And yeah, you can do that as a fighting game player. I get an email every other day about Raid Shadow Legends. The meme is true, bro. I get emails constantly to make good money for streaming Raid Shadow Legends. And I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be part of the meme. And there's a whole bunch of other ones like that, that, that just don't make sense for my stream. And I did that by streaming fighting games, right? Um, YouTube, YouTube is important because it has discoverability to drive people to your Twitch. So I'm not going to go into all the detail about like the Twitch and YouTube meta, but basically fighting game players have Twitch and YouTube channels. They do make some money from that, but there's also expensive, right? Um, expenses for the YouTube. Um, you have to pay your editors. So I have an editor. I pay him double A. He does the best editing in the business. You know, number one, carrying the YouTube channel and I have to pay him, right? It was an investment. I took the risk to start paying someone to edit for my YouTube channel at a loss to see where it would go. And the way it works for me currently with my sort of revenue stream, I don't always make the cost of the video back directly. Like I don't always directly like I pay so much per video. I don't always directly make that money back. And that's just the nature of the game, right? But however, I've been able to generate more money because people watch the YouTube channel and then they come to my Twitch stream. And that's where like pretty much all of you are here from like Tiger Z who very generously just gave out five gifted subs. Thank you very much for that. You guys are showing up here probably from YouTube and then you might drop a prime. You might drop five gifted like Tiger C. Thanks again. You know, you're going to become part of the ecosystem because the YouTube channel is the tier one. Like that's where that's the ocean. That's where all the fish are. That's where you're trying to cast your net. And then you might catch some of them in there and they'll, they'll, some of them will swim out of your net and, and not return. But some of them you'll get wrapped in. And they'll become part of your like ecosystem. They'll become part of your Twitch stream. They'll start chatting with you. They'll hang out. They'll, they'll go to your your uh, Twitter. They'll follow you there. They'll watch your, your tournaments. They'll be invested in you as a player. They'll root for your success. They'll spam your emotes when you're in another Twitch stream. And when you're doing when you're competing in a tournament, people will spam your emotes. And then they see other other people will see the fans supporting you in like the Capcom fighter stream. And then they'll see your emotes and they'll, they'll go to your stream. So basically it builds this whole ecosystem to pull in new people to support you. And so the YouTube part, the YouTube, I think is the, the, the foundation for this whole ecosystem. You must have the YouTube going. So this is how you make your money. I mean, everyone's doing it these days. You see Panic Global, they totally geared up, ramped up on content creation for all their players when COVID was going on because they recognized how important this really was. And I think it's been pretty profitable for them. I mean, they've hired multiple tiers of editors. They have editing managers now, you know, they've just been scaling up more and more to help pump out more content from every player and to grow their own personal brands. So it's super important. This is the most feasible way for people to make money playing fighting games. If you are a top 100 Street Fighter player in the world and you are not going hard on content creation, you will not make money. You will sink. There's no swimming. You will make nothing. And even then, the money you make here, 
I make okay money. I'm not making at my level, which I'm, you know, I don't have the biggest Twitch channel. I don't have the biggest YouTube, of course, but relatively in the Street Fighter world, I have one of the largest streams and I have one of the largest YouTube channels. And that's, that's not great. <laughs> That's not great. Uh, I'm trying to be humble about it because I'm not making like I, I'm still working my day job here. So it's not like I'm making big money, but there's something after years of doing this that I'm actually generating revenue from basically just investing in myself and my brand for years by doing tournaments where I just lost money. You know, I took my money from my day job, took my paycheck, used that money to fly my ass to tournaments and then lost it to eventually build up this thing to get people to watch my Twitch and YouTube channel. So this is where the money is for the vast majority of people. The rest of this may come if you get to a certain tier, but you should be able to not have to rely on teams and sponsors to do the pay travel, to get you into the tournament. You should be able to support your tournament travel via content creation, place well at the tournaments to get more people to watch your content. It should be this kind of loop here that you got going and you should not have to have the team and sponsor in the middle. Maybe you can use that to grow and skill and placements to get an actual fulfilling sponsor who can help you, you know, provide maybe a salary if you're one of the best in the world and you're lucky. But you know, the way things are, that's not the economics of the situation. You know, your content might not be that big if it's focused solely on fighting games. Um, you're, you're probably gonna have to diversify, which means you might not be able to practice as much as you need to win. So in general, there's not that much money. There's really not. Every content creator who diversified is the one who ended up making uh, a livable wage doing something in the Twitch sphere, right? You know, you have Eris avoiding the puddle. puddle. Sagem is up there, um, but Sagem doesn't compete. He does pretty much just solely content these days. That, that's it. He, you know, he's a commentator who used his skills to start producing content. You know, Maximilian Dude, of course, who uh, just does amazing jobs, uh, amazing work on YouTube, just getting out tons of content that appeals to casual people and grinding on that for years. And then he's, now he's able to play, you know, Warzone or Monster Hunter and have people watch and support him. So if you want to make more money, you got to diversify. This is how it is. Because fighting games themselves are just not that big. That said, I still think there are ways to make money, and this is this is pretty much all I know from uh, from my time in the FGC, from talking to people, from experience to get firsthand some of it myself. If you're a player, these are some ways to make money. I I think my list is pretty complete. You know, I, I have my ear to the street a bit here, so I think it's fairly com complete. But I could be missing some details. Could be missing some, but this is it. This is it. What do you guys think? Anything I'm missing? Forget rock, paper, scissors, hustling. That's true. You could try to make all your money to pay for your hotel room or, you know, that is an FGC classic. Show up to the tournament without a flight back and try to either hustle your way with money matches or uh, rock, paper, scissors, betting, side betting. You try to hustle your, your way into a, a flight back home. Money match players worse than you. It won't work anymore. That used to work in the Street Fighter 4 era. That was a real thing. Back in the Street Fighter 4 days, you could just money match people because the power of celebrity was greater in Street Fighter 4 than in Street Fighter 5. In Street Fighter 4, people would money match people for two reasons. Um, one, because people did not know exactly how good anyone is because there was less of an established tour. And so people's standings in the world weren't as clear and also online was trash. So you would you would be stuck playing your own community for so long that, you know, it's kind of like dogs on a leash. The, the more tension there is that separates them, the, the louder their barking gets until they can finally fight. So people did not know how strong they were. They wanted to test it out. And two, the, the power of celebrity was greater. So people would just pay to be able to play a player that they liked. That that was much higher back then in Street Fighter 4. But in Street Fighter V, it does not exist as much. It really does not. People are not, the fans or the, the more casual players are not as often paying to play known players. Squid game with the other top 100 players. All right, we, we're gonna round up all top 100 players and then we'll, we'll play for all the earnings that they made in the past year. So we'll all be killing everybody off for about $20,000. I'm forgetting the tried and true method of just begging outside the venue. I don't know about begging outside the venue, but you can try to get rid of your hotel expenses by just showing up to play sets in somebody's room and then just, uh, you know, 
slumping down into a corner silently and falling asleep. That's a South Florida classic right there. You know how many people I know from South Florida that would just show up and just fall asleep in, in your room? Wait, was that a thing? Was? Yo, it, it's such perfect, like, you know, you, you'd wake Buddy up, I'm telling you, it ain't that easy. The, the social manipulation, you know, they find a decently crowded room, you know, it's kind of a party vibe maybe, so, you know, people might be a little tipsy or something, they don't really, not really paying attention to each other, they might be temporarily asleep, and then, you know, it just, there's a, there's a skill to it. It's super common.